Practice Test 2. You will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. Write all your answers in the listening question booklet. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now, turn to section 1 on page 2 of your test booklet. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Section 1. You will hear a mother, Shirley, talking to Kate, an admissions officer at a school. First, you'll have some time to look at questions 1 to 3. You will see there is an example which has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Good morning. You must be Shirley Peters. My name's Kate. Yes, hello. I'm Shirley Peters. Nice to meet you. You have a 10 o'clock appointment with us? That's right. I'm supposed to go to the admissions office. Is that here? Mrs Peters has a 10am appointment, so you choose B... 10 a.m. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 3. Good morning. You must be Shirley Peters. My name's Kate. Yes, hello. I'm Shirley Peters. Nice to meet you. You have a 10 o'clock appointment with us. That's right. I'm supposed to go to the admissions office. Is that here? Yes, it is. Please take a seat as I have several forms for you to fill in to enable you to enrol your son at this school. We have a form for your name, address and so on one for the health of your son and one for him to choose extra subjects to join in. Thank you. Now, firstly, this form is just so we have a record of your son's personal details. Can you fill it in for me? Yes, I'll do that now. Can I just check the details with you? Your son's first name is John. No, that's his middle name after his father, Richard John. My son's name is Colwyn. Can you please spell it C-O-L-W-I-N, not C-O-L-W-Y-N, as some people do? Yes, I'll make a note of that. And how old is Colwyn? I've put down that he's entering year six, so therefore he's 11 years old, turning 12 this year. So at the moment, he's 11? Yes, correct. You now have some time to look at questions four to ten. Now answer questions 4 to 10. Let's move on to your address. Do you live at 7 Watley Crescent, Mount Lawley? Yes, that's right. The street is spelt W-H-A-T-L-E-Y Crescent in Mount Lawley. Yes, I can see you've written that. Which phone number is best to contact you on? Well, I'm out and about doing things during the day, so probably my mobile rather than the home number. So that's 041 Yes, 041 Secondly, can you complete this form regarding your son's health? Yes, I'll do it for you now. Thank you. Now, can I go through the more important areas of this form with you to make sure our information is accurate? Yes, of course. Is your son taking any medication at the moment that the teachers will need to be aware of? Yes, he has asthma, so he will be carrying his puffer in his school bag. So he has a puffer. Is he allergic to anything? Yes, peanuts. Actually, he should avoid all types of nuts. That's okay. 
because we have a policy of not having any nuts in our school. Is there anything else that you think we should be aware of? As I've written down, he also wears glasses, which he needs to keep on all the time. I'll highlight that section on the form so his teacher will know about his glasses. Finally, this school has a wide range of interesting subjects that your son can participate in. Could you mark on this form what your son would like to do? Yes, certainly. Here you are. Firstly, it seems your son is particularly interested in football, so I'll make a note of that. Secondly, with regard to music, would you like him to start learning the piano in music class? Yes, that would be fantastic. Now, turning to art, I'll let his art teacher know that he likes drawing cartoons. Wonderful. Finally, let's look at languages now. Did you know that Mandarin was actually only started at the school this year? Really? Well, I think Chinese would be the most useful, even though my son's friends have already been learning Indonesian and Italian. Well, now we have all the information we require about your son. We hope he enjoys himself at our school. I'm sure he will. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 2 on page 4 of your listening test booklet. Section 2 You will hear a recorded message giving information about an area where tourists can visit to taste local food. First, you will have some time to look at questions 11 to 13. Now listen carefully to the first part of the message and answer questions 11 to 13. Welcome to the tourist information line for the Valley Food Trail. Here you will find many local food products for you to sample and buy. It is possible for you to spend as much or as little time as you want, but I suggest that you allow a full day for touring this area. Of course, there are many half-day tours available for those of you short on time. Now, it's quite a large area and stretches from Brookville to Ford Hill. For those of you unfamiliar with the area, that means that it is 10 kilometres to 35 kilometres from the city centre, or by car 15 minutes to the closest point, continuing to 55 minutes at its furthest point from the CBD. Of course, apart from food, there are many other places of interest in this area, including cafes and restaurants and galleries and studios. But I wouldn't recommend you go here to see parks and gardens. The other information lines will give you specific information related to these particular attractions. Before the final part of the message, you now have 20 seconds to look at questions 14 to 20. Now answer questions 14 to 20. But let's go back to food. If we begin in Brookville and head north towards Upper Valley in a clockwise direction, passing West Valley on West Road, we cross over Coast Road to come to our first place of interest, Magic Coffee. This is not to be confused with the coffee house, situated opposite on the other side of the valley on the railway line. Magic Coffee is next to the chocolate company, which is on the corner. Just past the ice cream shop on the corner of John Street is the fresh produce shop. 
A little further north, we have reached Ford Hill, where we can start our drive southwards along Great Northern Highway following the railway line. First, we come to the organic market near the corner of Memorial Avenue and then to Olive Farm opposite Olive Road. Just before we come to the next street crossing, we see the Honey Pot, which is practically opposite the coffee house. There is another chocolate company which sells nougat as well, just nearby. Following the railway line along Great Northern Highway, we return back to Brookville. Now, as I have said previously, if you only have a few hours to spare, there are several places that you shouldn't miss. The two chocolate places make equally nice chocolate, but the factory has the added bonus of nougat, unlike the company. Of course, everyone loves ice cream, especially unusual flavours such as coffee and nougat. So the ice creamery is definitely worth a visit. And while the coffee house sells expertly made hot drinks, including hot chocolate, I think your time would be better spent sampling the many products on offer at the organic market. Well, I hope you enjoy your time visiting the Valley Food Trail and enjoy all the wonderful local foods on offer. That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3 on page 6 of your listening test booklet. Section 3 You will hear an interview with Professor Green from a local university which enrols a large number of overseas students in its courses. He is talking to Indra, a student representative about the importance of attending lectures. First, you will have half a minute to look at questions 21 to 30. Now listen carefully to the interview and answer questions 21 to 30. Good afternoon, Professor Green. Thank you for your time today. I wonder if you could explain why you think it is important for us to attend lectures in a course that we're studying. Well, despite the increasing dependence on online communication these days, I do think it is important. Apart from delivering the content of the lecture itself, I believe that there are some general communication benefits from having large groups of students together in one place. For lecturers, it is an opportunity for us to address many students together at one time. For students, it helps you to feel part of the wider learning community who are following the course. You can interact with each other both before and after the lecture to discuss the ideas and content, networking with each other and comparing your notes. But isn't most of this achieved, as you said, these days through online communication? Well, lecturers do communicate with students online, of course, but we usually only give a summary or notes of the lecture, so there are significant differences. When you go to lectures, you get more of an insight into what the lecturer considers important. We give additional commentary and anecdotes, and by voice emphasis, we can alert you to the key concepts theories and issues of the subject. By not attending lectures, you might miss crucial information about what we are expecting in an assignment. You know, these extra things can make a difference. OK, but there are tutorials. There is a lot of interaction between students and lecturers in tutorials. Can't all this be done in tutorial discussion groups instead of having lectures? Yes, to some extent. 
But during lectures, the lecturers can sensitise you to the debates and the controversies that are dealt with in the literature. This can help you think more critically about the subject. So then, when you come to the tutorial, you'll be able to come with some questions and ideas for discussion. The result of this is that the tutorial class will be more beneficial for everyone who attends. I see your point. However, surely this also depends on whether students are able to understand and follow the lecture well. What strategies do you recommend to help students get the most out of lectures? I would say that first of all, it is important to do some pre-reading. By doing this, you get an orientation to the topic. You'll become familiar with the key terms and you'll be able to follow the lecture points more easily. I also think it is good to arrive early to collect handouts and to find a seat where it is easy to see and hear what is going on. Then, importantly, during the lecture itself, you need to be attentive. I know from experience that it is often difficult to be attentive. What can students do to improve their attentiveness during the lecture? I think that there are two keys to following a lecture successfully, using the visual cues and using active listening techniques. By maintaining eye contact with the lecturer and following how the lecturer makes use of the slides, whiteboard and so on, you are using the lecturer's visual cues which help make the structure of the information clear and give you a sense of what's important. Then, using active listening techniques will also help you to process the information. What do you mean by active listening techniques? Well, you need to pay attention to the methods the lecturer uses to highlight important information. As I said before, in the spoken language of a lecture, we get the benefit of things such as stress and intonation, use of examples and anecdotes, as well as the language signals used to show relationships between ideas. Yes, I see what you mean. These things will be missing in written summaries. And what about taking notes? Does that help? Taking notes helps you to concentrate, so I would certainly advise you to do that. It's difficult to listen and write good notes at the same time, so it does take some training. Yes, taking notes needs a lot of practice, I've found. Do you have any other advice? Well, I can't finish without stressing the importance of formulating questions while you are listening. During the lecture, you should ask yourself questions about the content of the lecture and the points you are following. Ask questions like, what are the benefits or problems? What other examples are there? How does it work? Why does this happen? This will keep you focused and actively engaged in the content of the lecture. Professor Green, thank you very much for your valuable tips and your time today. You are very welcome. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 4 on page 8 of your listening test booklet. Section 4 You will hear an expert on birds talking about sparrows, one of the most common bird species in urban and suburban environments around the world. The expert discusses some possible causes for their declining numbers. First, you will have half a minute to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully to the talk 
and answer questions 31 to 40. Some people dislike sparrows and see them as annoying pests in their neighbourhood. Others see them as an interesting part of the urban environment. Love them or hate them, it could be that the familiar scene of these birds flying, hopping and chirping in our city streets will soon become a thing of the past. Until recently, there were so many sparrows around that people tried all kinds of methods to get rid of them, but it now seems that many people are starting to worry about the declining numbers of sparrows in many cities around the world. Over the past 20 or 30 years, sparrows have been disappearing throughout many parts of the world. In Britain, since the 1920s, the overall population of sparrows has declined by 92%. In London, they were once so plentiful that people who conducted regular surveys did not bother to count them because they were simply too common. Now there are none. This decline has also been recorded in some cities in continental Europe, parts of North America and India as well. Some people will be surprised at this, as they probably still see many sparrows in their local neighbourhood. But whereas some suburbs may have large numbers of sparrows, in the next suburb there may be none. So, why are they disappearing rapidly in some areas, yet still exist in large numbers in others? Well, it is a bit of a mystery. Some say it is due to local issues. There are a number of factors here, one of which is harassment or predation. Other local animal species harass them, and domestic cats hunt them for food. Secondly, there is increased competition both for food and for nesting sites from other seed-eating birds in the neighbourhood. And thirdly, it is now more difficult for sparrows to make nests in modern buildings due to more effective modern building methods. Recent studies suggest that another reason may be related to a problem with the breeding success of the sparrows. Although they continue to breed, the young nestlings keep dying. These deaths have been linked to a lack of insects, such as aphids, this decrease in the availability of insects, it is believed, then causes the young nestlings to die of starvation or dehydration. It seems that there is a growing worldwide shortage of insects, and our modern urban lifestyle with the increasing use of motor vehicles is being blamed for it. It is suggested that the carcinogenic chemicals released into the atmosphere by unleaded car exhaust fumes is having an impact on insect numbers. Another theory, which is thought to be affecting sparrow numbers, is connected to our technological advancement. According to some experts, the mobile telephone towers that are now a feature of our modern cities emit electromagnetic radiation, which might affect the sparrow's central nervous systems and result in their death. The evidence is only circumstantial, and sparrows still continue to thrive in some major cities. However, it is interesting to note that in the 1990s, the use of mobile phones and unleaded petrol skyrocketed, and both coincide with the period of the sparrow's declining numbers in many modern cities. That is the end of the listening test. You now have half a minute to check your answers. You now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the listening answer sheet.
That is the end of the listening test. Practice test three. You will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. Write all your answers in the listening question booklet. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now, turn to section 1 on page 2 of your test booklet. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Section 1. You will hear two friends, Nancy and Fiona, catching up with each other. First you will have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. You will see that there is an example which has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be repeated. Hello Fiona, I haven't seen you for ages. Hi Nancy, it must be two years I think. Has it been that long? It seems like yesterday that we were regularly catching up with each other on Friday mornings at that cafe around the corner from you. It has been two years since Nancy has seen Fiona, so you circle B, two years. Now, listen carefully and answer questions one to six. Hello, Fiona. I haven't seen you for ages. Hi, Nancy. It must be two years, I think. Has it been that long? It seems like yesterday that we were regularly catching up with each other on Friday mornings at that cafe around the corner from you. Yes, I remember our chats at Café Bellissimo over a nice hot coffee and cake. Do you still work part-time or are you busier now? Well, actually, since I saw you last, I've had a baby girl who's with her grandmother at the moment. So I'm free to pay bills and do grocery shopping. What about yourself? What are you up to these days? Well, actually, I've started my own business, so I'm pretty busy. I'd call it full-time work myself, although the hours are very flexible. Wow. That sounds really fascinating. What sort of business is it? Well, we were initially going to open a shop, but we thought it would be easier to sell our product online. And a market stall would have been too hard to manage. We also thought it would be a great idea to sell, not just in Perth, but all over Australia as well. So what do you sell? We're selling children's costumes from around the world. Interesting. How did you come up with the idea? As you know, Perth is such a multicultural society... At my children's school, there are so many immigrant children. Many of the families find it difficult to get traditional things from their culture, including clothes for special celebrations. With our extensive business travelling over the years, we have made numerous contacts in many countries. You now have 20 seconds to look at questions 7 to 10. Now answer questions 7 to 10. So how many countries' costumes do you sell? At the moment, I have a good range of countries. I have access to 10 from Africa and similarly from Asia with 10 nationalities. I have slightly more from the Americas with 13 and more again from Europe with 25. Unfortunately, I only have six for the Pacific region, but I'm expanding all the time. When do you find time to run your business? Well, that's the problem at the moment. I have so many things to organise, but I don't have enough time to do everything. Do you see an accountant or do you do your tax yourself? I get all of my receipts and expenses together, but then I go to an accountant who fills in my tax return as it takes me too much time. What about your website? 
You said that your company's growing all the time. Yes, it's true that my website continually needs to be updated, but it only takes me a short time each week to do it. So that is one area I can manage myself. Do you advertise your business anywhere? Where do your customers come from? It's interesting you should ask. Most of my business is word of mouth, but I do hand out a lot of business cards. I get them done by the local printer, although I must admit that they are rather plain. I need to add a little colour when I get time to redesign them in the future. Well, it's been great catching up with you and finding out all about your business. I'm very interested in looking at your website when I get home. Here's my business card so that you can email me for our next get-together. Don't bother about a babysitter next time. Bring your daughter with you as I'd love to meet her. That sounds like a great idea. See you soon. Goodbye. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 2 on page 4 of your listening test booklet. Section 2 The Overseas Students Club is organising a tour of the city to help new students to find their way around. You will hear the tour guide giving them a talk about what will happen the next day and some instructions as to what to do. First, you'll have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully to the first part of the talk and answer questions 11 to 15. Hello everyone, I'd like to welcome you to our city. I hope that you will have an interesting and valuable experience with us. As you know, we're going on a tour tomorrow to show you some of the sites and the places of interest. So I would like to give you some instructions and some information to prepare you for tomorrow. It is important that we all meet at the same place at the same time. You should all be able to get into the centre of the city by train or bus from your homestay. We want to start our tour at 10am, so you'll have to make sure that you leave home around 9.15 in time to arrive for us to start the tour at 10. If you are late, we will not be able to wait more than a few minutes, so I suggest that you take your mobile phone and have my number just in case. My number is 0482 557369. I will just repeat that so you can get it. 0482 557369. You can see Ms Parker after the talk if you do not have her number and she will be happy to provide it. It's good to have both our numbers just in case. Oh, and another thing. It is better to buy a one-way ticket because the tour will last for three hours and a return ticket lasts only for two hours. Before the final part of the talk, you now have 20 seconds to look at questions 16 to 20. Now answer questions 16 to 20. Now, we are meeting at the Town Hall. You should be able to make your way there from the bus or train stations, which are both in Flinders Street. It is only a short walk from both stations. If you're coming into the city by train, the Town Hall is straight ahead of you when you exit the station. Just walk up Collins Street and you will see it on the left after the traffic lights. If you come in by bus, you will need to turn right at the exit, then take the first street left, which is Collins Street you will see the town hall on your maps. So if you have your maps with you, it's a good idea to mark the route now. Now, there will probably be quite a few people around in the city when you arrive, so it is important that we can find each other. Please don't go inside the building. We should all meet outside on the steps of the town hall to make sure we don't miss anyone. 
From there, we will be visiting a few places of interest. We will make our way to the library, which is in the same street. It will take us about 10 minutes on foot. It is a good library for students, so we'll be giving you about 20 minutes to have a look around at the facilities. That probably won't be enough time for all of you to join the library, so you'll have to come back at another time to do that. It might be a good idea to pick up a membership form before you leave. From the library, we will turn right into William Street, where you'll see a cinema on the left. This is popular with the students, and it shows some interesting art house movies. On the way, you might want to check out what is showing there at the moment. Diagonally opposite the cinema is the art gallery. There will be time, about 15 minutes, for a quick look at some of the exhibits. You will probably want to return by yourself for a longer visit another time. From there, we will walk up to the main street, which is Wellington Street, on your maps. It's around the next corner from the art gallery, and will show you some cheap but excellent restaurants, as well as cafes and bars, which I'm sure you will find useful in your free time. They are frequented by many of the students here, so I recommend that you come back later to sample the food and atmosphere. It is a good way to meet some of the local students as well. Well, I said that it would take about three hours. This is because we will be stopping at the park for a picnic lunch. The park is a 15-minute walk along the main street from the restaurant area. We will be supplying the lunch for everyone, so you won't need to bring anything. However, you will need to bring or buy your own drinks. If anyone has any special dietary requirements, please see me or Ms Parker after this talk. Oh, and please make sure that you wear some comfortable clothes. Sensible walking shoes are advisable, as you will be doing quite a lot of walking. It is also a good idea to bring some sunscreen and a hat, as the sun can be quite strong at this time of the year. Finally, although the tour is free, you might want to bring some extra money with you for drinks or souvenirs. Well, I hope you all enjoy the tour and get to know each other. I'm sure we will have a great day. Now, anyone who needs to see me? That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3 on page 6 of your listening test booklet. Section 3. You will hear a student, Sandra, talking to a student advisor about her approaching exam. First, you will have half a minute to look at questions 21 to 30. Now listen carefully to the conversation and answer questions 21 to 30. I've got an exam tomorrow and I'm worried about how it will go. Do you have any tips? I think I'm well prepared. I've done all the revision and I've been practising lots of exam questions, but I still feel nervous about the exam itself. I know what you mean, but if you're well prepared, you should be fine. You just need to stay calm and keep reminding yourself that you are prepared. That's easy to say, but in an exam, unexpected things happen. Well, there are a few things that I found helpful. You don't want to run out of energy or feel sleepy during the exam, so make sure you eat something beforehand. Also, it's a good idea to leave home early to allow for any traffic jams or parking problems. You don't want to arrive late or even worse, miss the exam altogether. That's good advice. But if I get there too early, I might start getting nervous while I'm waiting. That can happen, especially if you start talking to others about the exam. You know how they can start saying things like, there's bound to be a question on such and such, or most people failed this subject last year. I found that this kind of talk can just make you panic. So if you arrive very early, read through your notes while you are waiting. 
I think you'll find it helps you to stay calm. Okay. What about during the exam? I keep thinking about the things that can go wrong. Well, I think the most important piece of advice would be to read the instructions and questions carefully. Make sure you know how many questions and sections there are so that you don't miss any. Then make sure you know how you're expected to answer them. Yeah, it would be terrible to fail because I missed a whole question or section. That's right. Timing is also important. You don't want to miss a question because you run out of time either. Allocate a time for each question and stick to it. And because timing is vital during an exam, I always wear a watch just in case there isn't a clock in the exam room. It helps to keep you on track. Also, if you see that time is running out, briefly answer or just guess the answer to as many of the questions as you can. Yes, especially for multiple choice questions. I could be lucky and select the correct one. True. Even if you don't know the answer, you could still gain valuable marks by guessing. Another important thing is to write the number of words required for an essay question. If your essay is too long or too short, you could lose a lot of marks. You could also waste a lot of time. And I have seen students do badly because they spent too much time on one essay, then didn't have enough time left to complete another one. So look to see how many marks are allocated for each essay and divide your time accordingly. Thanks. Look, this is all terrific advice, but what if I suddenly start to panic or get a memory block in the middle of the exam? Well, you have to think positively. You know you are prepared and you know that you can pass. As soon as you feel yourself starting to get panicky, relax and take slow, deep breaths. You should allow yourself to take a few seconds to stretch your arms, legs, neck and back occasionally too. I found that this helps. It can also be useful if you start to feel physically tired during the exam. Yes, I can see how that could help. I'm feeling more relaxed as we speak. Good. Oh, and one more thing. It's not a good idea to leave the room before the time is up, even if you have finished all the questions. Spelling, grammar and punctuation mistakes can make a difference to your marks. So try to leave some time at the end for checking your answers. I don't think I'll be leaving early somehow. Look, you've been really helpful. I'm very grateful. Not at all. You're welcome. Just remember that you've worked hard on your preparation and you are familiar with the exam. Think positively and stay calm. I'm sure you will do well. Good luck for tomorrow. Thank you very much. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 4 on page 8 of your listening test booklet. Section 4. You will hear a talk by a financial advisor about debt. First, you will have half a minute to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully to the talk and answer questions 31 to 40. Welcome to today's public lecture on the topic of personal debt. I'm Ray Goodman from the Community Debt Centre and I'd like to present to you today the second part of our three lecture series. Today we're going to look at how debt affects our lives. Debt is nothing new. It's found throughout human history and in every society. Many people know what it feels like to be in debt. 
Those of you who have bought a house will probably have a mortgage. Perhaps you have borrowed money from family or friends or got a loan for a car. Debt can sometimes be a way of juggling financial commitments and of paying in advance for things that you really need. For everyday living, you might not earn enough money from your job to pay for all the things that you need. You may require a little extra money in the form of credit cards. But debt has a darker side. Imagine how you would feel if you were deeply in debt and unable to repay what you owed. The consequences for many people can be disastrous. Today, people in the richer countries of the world live in a society where credit is easily accessible. Banks, building societies and credit card companies often encourage people to take out loans. They then make money by charging interest. For very low income earners, borrowing from a bank can be impossible. Instead, they are forced to take out a much higher interest loan from a private lender. They soon find that, despite cutting back on many essentials, they are unable to keep up with these repayments. They are forced to take out another loan and find themselves plunging deeper and deeper into debt. People can find themselves with growing debts if they are unable to repay interest. This may be because of a sudden life-changing event, such as a business failure or losing a job. But for many households, debt is a means of survival. In developing countries, people borrow a tiny sum of money from a local landowner, for example, to pay for medical treatment. They agree that a child would work as a full-time servant to repay the debt, and that child becomes a bonded labourer. But since they are never paid, there is no hope of clearing the debt. Their life is ruled by fear. With no money, education or experience of life, it is impossible for them to escape. Today, debt bondage is a major form of slavery. As you can see, debt affects everyone all over the world to varying degrees. I hope the information I have presented to you today will make you think twice about getting into spiralling debt. Of course, if you are already finding yourself in financial difficulties, please make an appointment to see one of our helpful staff members after this talk. Thank you. That is the end of the listening test. You now have half a minute to check your answers. You now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the listening answer sheet.
that is the end of the listening test.